This is the Flyer Delphia Podcast, presented by SportstalkPhilly.com, with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heenan. Hello, Flyers fans, and welcome into another episode of the Flyer Delphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com. I'm your host, Kevin Durso. Joined by Rob Riches and Dan Heening. If you are listening live, we do thank you for tuning in tonight. Well, guys, it's been a little while since we were last on here to talk Flyers hockey. Four more games have come and gone, and it's been a mixed bag of results for the Flyers. There was the hard-fought, tight-checking 1-0 loss to Nashville on home ice, followed by a very strong 2-1 win over the Edmonton Oilers in a similarly tight-checking game. And then on Tuesday, the Flyers had their first real forgettable game of the season with a 6-2 loss to the Anaheim Ducks. But we're really going to start off here by going... We don't want to go straight to those games because we really want to start with the Thursday night game in Ottawa because we really can't begin anywhere else. It's all that anybody is talking about. And Dan, what I want to say, at least to you, because we were on here last week, and that was probably as positive of a show as we could have had just talking about the recent results and everything like that. This is going to be a bit more of the norm, right? Yeah, this is definitely going to be a little bit more negative, uh, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit more uh loathing especially towards the officiating and the nhl in general uh yeah it's it was a i i went back and i listened to the first uh the a block that we did mm-hmm. and uh a lot of positivity a lot of things going right and uh not so much anymore yeah we'll definitely get into a lot of that um throughout the throughout the show tonight um but we really just have to start with this game in ottawa because like we said there's been a lot of it starts, yes, the officiating is one big part of it. There's no question about it. But when you look at everything else that comes into play, there's just a lot of different things that come into play. Defensive play comes into it. There's goalie talk that we're going to get into a little bit as well. Obviously, there's one piece of the defense that is missing now that has caused shuffling to go on among the pairs, and people are calling for a certain prospect to be called up. A lot of it. We're tr- we're trying. I'm trying my best here to not give all of it away to you in the first five minutes of the show. But that's kind of the deal with it. And it, it was also another one of those games, slow start, bad first period. The Flyers definitely were behind the eight ball in this in this game, no question about it. But the bigger thing here is that when it came down to it, the game completely turned in a different direction or went against the Flyers twice because of officiating with two overturned calls. Let's set the stage for you first, and then I'll turn it over to the guys to kind of begin the discussion on this, because there's a lot to discuss. Uh, the first overturned call was a goalie interference call um, off of a Brandon Manning goal. Brandon Manning takes a slap shot from the point, finds the net. There was a good screen in front by both Wayne Simmons and Jordan Wheel. Jordan Wheel is closer to goalie Craig Anderson at the time. He's in the blue paint just slightly, makes an effort to leap up, not make contact with the goalie. Anderson actually initiates the contact, and by rule, if you read the actual written rule in the NHL rule book, even if the goalie initiates contact, as long as the player was in the blue paint before everything started, is and, and it is ruled to have disrupted his ability to make the save, then it is considered goalie interference. So they go to review. Uh, Ottawa does a coach's challenge on that one, gets the call overturned, so it becomes... What was going to be a 4-3 to three game, the Flyers, half, about halfway through the third period, finding a way to get the next goal, to make it a one-goal game again. And it was going to be 4-3 with a lot of time left for the Flyers to have to get the equalizer. It turns back into a 4-2 game. Less than a minute later, Ottawa scored again on a 2-1-1 to make it 5-2. to And it felt like the game was over right then and there. But the Flyers do show their resiliency. They get a goal from uh, Ivan Provorov first to cut the lead to two again, then a goal on a deflection by Sean Couturier made it a one-goal game with under two minutes to go. Now you start thinking about possibilities. There were a lot of other chances for players before we get to the call that really turns turns everybody upside down. Turns the, it, it should be turning the league office upside down, and if somebody had access to the league office, it might be uh, a problem because somebody, somebody might do something destructive, uh, at least based on the way that everybody sounded after that game last night but the second overturned call or not oh it wasn't an overturned call more or less it was a reviewed play that apparently based on the ruling that was given should have never been because it wasn't a reviewable play but they still looked at it which is the confusing part to start with 
basically, here's the scenario. Sean Couturier is at the side of the net, jamming away at a, at a loose puck, and it happens to kind of ride up the pad of Craig Anderson and rolls in. He's got his glove on top of the pad to try to make the save, and it falls into the glove, but the glove is in the net. The puck then can be seen crossing the line going into the glove. So by all accounts, at least is what the video shows, it's a good goal. Apparently, here's where the good old intent to blow play dead ruling comes out, and it nullifies the rest of the play because from the moment the puck was under Anderson's skate, it wasn't a reviewable play anymore. It was just play was blown dead, and that's it. The baffling part of this is that no explanation was given to the Flyers on the ice at the moment at that time. Uh, the official announcing the call just calls the play complete, which is a new that's a new one. Um, and then you get the last forty nine seconds or fifty six seconds, I should say, of the game where the Flyers are trying to frantically find a way to tie the game. They never really. They had one late chance, but they really never got as as close as they were right there. So basically, two calls that should have gone the Flyers' way took two goals off the board and completely altered the result of the game. What are you, Let's just go right into it, guys. What's your take on it? How are you feeling about this? Is it all dis- should it all be directed to the officials in this case or, you know, are the Flyers partially to br- to blame themselves also because of the fact that this is a, you know they were in the situation because of their poor play to start the game. It's a good rally, but you can't be relying on a goal like that late. You might just want to do something convincing. What are your guys' thoughts? Let's just see what see what we got here because this is going to be a big bulk of the show probably. A lot to talk about with this. So go ahead, guys. Can we uh, find a way to blame Justin Trudeau for this? <laughs> we're bringing I'm blame Justin Trudeau for this. We're bringing a Canadian government into this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's the game was in Ottawa. That's what Parliament Hill is, right? That's true. This is um, we're taking it right to the top, I guess. This is a this is a Canadian, a full on Canadian issue. Then this is this one has to go straight to the government. Prime Minister Trudeau, I know you're a big fan of the program. I know you're listening right now, and we do appreciate it. But I uh, <laughs> demand something be done about this. <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, I I, I do understand. The whole intent to blow. I mean, I, I at least I try to understand it because when you think about how fast paced the hockey game is, you know, when the, the referee goes to blow the whistle, you know, it, it, there's always, you know, things that can happen, you know, right before the whistle can be fully blown. But at the end of the day, it's kind of one of those rules that's uh, kind of like how the catch rules are in the NFL where really nobody has any idea, you know, why they're there. Nobody knows what they are. Nobody knows what they're supposed to be. So it's one of those things that. You know, it's kind of a uh, CYA move uh, for the officials. You know, they can say, well, <laughs> oh. that's where I tried to, to, to blow the whistle there. And it, it's one of those things where, you know, the, the league, obviously, they want to go to bat for their officials. They they, they want to help those guys out. So yeah. uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the rules in place there, and, you know, it's not exactly uh, the biggest rule I agree with. Uh, I I would rather have the two-line pass rule than that rule, I can tell you that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's that, that, it, it's one of those things where, you know, the uh, the officials, you know, once in a while, you know, it, it's a very un- – I try not to blame the refs when I can. It, it's a very difficult job, especially at that level. But once in a while, you get the, the, the referees that try to make the game about them, and that's just kind of what last night's game had the, the vibe of. It what are your thoughts, seems, Dan? It certainly seems that uh, when, you know, when, when you look at these plays, you look, them, look at both of them uh, back on replay with – you know, wheel crossing through the crease. You know, he doesn't make any con- He doesn't initiate any, con- any contact, but he needed to get out of the crease a little bit faster. And with this last goal, like I looked at it a couple times, and I think the one saving grace for the league is that you can't conclusively see that the puck crosses the goal line. You see that it goes in the glove. You can see that the glove is behind the post, and then you can make assumptions. You could say like, mm-hmm. yeah, well, the post is behind the, the the post is you know the goal line is right there with the post. It's beyond the post, so therefore it's beyond the goal line. But you, when you're calling a goal on the ice, whether it's a goal, no goal, it has to be 100% conclusive, and you can never see the puck. Like once it hits the glove, you can't see it anymore. You can see like, all right, it's right there between the mesh, but you can't 100% see that the puck, in fact, crosses the goal line, and it is in fact the goal. And with the intent to, we've heard the intent to blow excuse. A hundred times before, so it's not you know mm-hmm. particularly brand brand new. Like it, it's happened, and this isn't even the first time that th- this type of play has happened in the NHL this season. 
it happened like less than 10 days ago in the Colorado St. Louis game mm-hmm. where uh, Miko Rantanen scored a goal to tie it up 4 4. And the whole, and it's just as bizarre as this one because the, uh, the, the linesman got bumped, bumped, so he couldn't see that the play was offside. But then the player brought the puck onside. Mm-hmm. And then, therefore, the play becomes cleansed, so you can't review it anymore. But then they reviewed it anyway, and they called the goal off. And so the NHL apologized and said, like, yeah, that should have counted. When the goal should never have counted because the play was offside. So it, it, it's one of these bizarre things that the NHL really needs to just crack down on its own rules and fix these things. That was, nobody that was in, I'm sorry? Uh, no, they just need to crack down on their own rules and just they make make this clear. Make, make it so, like, all right, this is what happens in this type of situation, like, in that St. Louis situation, like if you just allow a coach to challenge anything, just allow the coach to be able to say, like, that wasn't off. That was offside. This was an offside because the big mm-hmm. controversy is that the linesman let the let the uh, the review take place when it was a non reviewable play. And then for this one, there just needs the, the referee needed to explain it better rather than the play is complete, which, as you just said, Kevin, no one's heard before. Yeah. Rob, what were you going to say before before I jump in? Yeah, that, that that was just a a matter of when when the NHL admitted that it, that was kind of a surprise to see that they came out and said that they were wrong about that. Yeah, you know, that's something to, that kind of took me off guard. Yeah, they haven't done that in forever. If, that's if, the, if that's ever. the first time they've done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, here here's my thing on this. Uh, I'm gonna say one thing that I said. I I wrote it in the post game review last night, and I tweeted it separately before I published the post-game review. The act of blowing the play dead reasoning is the biggest cop-out in sports officiating. Because if you don't know for sure, I mean, I understand there's ways to determine, and I I, re- I actually partially agree with you, Dan, that if, that if the reasoning was we don't have a conclusive look, you have no choice but to accept it because you're, tr- you're going to have to take the benefit of the doubt. We're going to see one thing that we really want to see because we want to believe that the puck is completely over the line, but it is difficult to tell. That I completely get. But to just sit there and say the play was complete and then offer a ruling that was, well, he's lost sight of it, so we're, he was going to blow the play dead, but, he, uh, but clearly the second shot was taken that puts the puck in Anderson's glove before the whistle was blown. You know, I don't care what the act of it is. It's it's a way to go backwards and say, well, I was going to do that, but I didn't. So that shot never, it, it takes, it's like erasing time. That it's, it's saying that never existed. That shot that you saw where the puck comes up, goes in the glove, it, it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. And that's, it's, it's baffling to me that a league can allow their officiating to sit there and use that as an excuse as a way, or not even as an excuse, but just as a way to kind of back off and go, here's your reason. Here's a reasoning for you that will that's supposedly going to gloss it all over, make it seem like it's okay because you just didn't have, you weren't trying to let that part of the play happen, and that's why, that's why we're going to take the goal away. So I don't like that excuse at all, or that reasoning. I, I think it's stupid. I think it's the, it's the dumbest thing. There, the other problem that I have with with some of the rules in the, in the NHL right now. And it, and it's not just an NHL problem. There's too much, there's too much gray area and misunderstanding when it comes to rule books and sports in general. If you go to other sports, Rob mentioned in the NFL, some, it's hard to determine truthfully what a catch is anymore because there's rules that there's new rules in place that make it so complex and leave so much gray area that you don't know what a catch is sometimes. Then you have, in the um, in Major League Baseball, when they implemented the home plate collision rule and allowing a clear path to home plate and all of that, there's people who don't know what blocking the plate really is because there's gray area in that too. So here's two situations really because now we've seen at least twice in in the league by bringing in the uh, by bringing the Colorado call. Um, into the conversation, we've seen two situations where we're not sure what's allowed to be reviewed and what's not, whereas everything should be fair game no matter what the intention was. It should just be fair game. I understand now with a less than a minute to go that Dave Haxtell's hands are tied. He's not allowed to, at that at that point, really initiate the review. And then the, the situation room initiates a review that they want to go to. And as soon as – in other words, though, but as soon as the official says – I was at, I was going to blow the whistle. I was in the act of blowing play dead. 
then there's no review. It's it by the rule book. It's supposed to not be reviewable. So why pull the monitor out? But maybe it is reviewable because one rule says, oh yeah, we can use video to make sure that the puck crossed the line. So we allow all quote good hockey goals to stand. And then there's another rule that says that if the official is in the act of blowing play dead, nothing's review- reviewable. So there's two yep. different rules and two different sections of the NHL rule book that contradict each other. It's got to be clarified. There's got to be some clarity to this so that these situations don't happen. It's costing teams games at this point. The goal that Colorado was cost was a game-tying goal as well, and they never got that one back. So you're watching teams who are fighting hard to get points in the standings at a time where, you know what, it's easy to sit there and say, move on to the next game. But... Points in October are just as valuable as points in March. We were talking about this on the last few weeks' shows. The fact that the Flyers came out and have won five of their first nine games going into the Thursday game is an accomplishment. It, yeah, are you disappointed with the way that the Anaheim game went because it's a very – it turned a really strong homestand where the only loss they had to that point was a one nothing game against Nashville into – what Dave Haxtell called an average homestand. It was an average three and two. Is con- he viewed it as average. It's the one thing I like about Haxtell right now is that he hasn't shied away from saying things that are on his mind. He's he called the homestand average when the Flyers lost six to two on home ice against Anaheim. He didn't shy away from saying what he felt about the calls on on Thursday night. He also didn't he used the um, on Tuesday's game. A couple of the Flyers noted that the ice surface wasn't really up to par, and it was the and a couple of them said it was the worst they'd ever seen there. It was horrendous, all that. And Haxtell quickly put that aside and went, "That's not an excuse. You don't blame that for it. Both teams played on the same ice. You either perform or you don't, and everybody's got to look in the mirror. It's good to see that from your coach, but the situations that they're getting in, this is just it's been a baffling season already when you think about." The first Nashville game being as wild as it gets, then the the way that the homestand ended with just a complete lackadaisical game, one that you just trash as soon as you get finished with it, and then the way that that game went on Thursday, it's a 5-4 game, it's another one of those wild finishes. This is 10 games into the season, and we've got three games that you're looking at where you're going, one's forgettable, two were just totally crazy, and the rest are pretty decent for the most part but it's it's very 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 you know it's very very confusing the way that the officials handed the handled the end of that game was confusing only because the rule book states two different things and they allowed one to override the other in a setting where it's contradictory and that that bothers me it it bothers me that there's even a way to go around one rule with another rule and let's not forget the sole purpose of Uh, instant replay in sports in the challenge system in the NHL in particular is just to to make things easier, just to basically, you know, kind of simplify things, make sure that, you know, well, as tough a job as refereeing is, make sure that everything's all right, make sure the officials are held to a high standard. But at at this point in games like last night and games like that Colorado game, it's all becoming convoluted. It really is. It's all becoming complicated. Well, and it, we're going to have to implement a, a review system for the reviews. That's going to come next week. Yeah, well, it, it, it will be complicated and continue to be complicated if there's no clarifications to this stuff. If there's still a gray area when you're making a review, then it allows there to be a dictation on the rule in one way or the other. There shouldn't be. If a rule is a rule, you should be able to come out with a clear ruling. So if, if you want to sit there, you know, no one would have argued that call last night. If the ruling on the ice is inconclusive, we can't tell that the puck crosses the line. If that's the answer, you have to deal with that because they're going to sit there and say, as much as you want to believe that you saw what you think you saw, they're going to sit there and say, we can't completely tell. That's a reasoning. That's a a ruling that's been around for, for a while. But this idea of saying blow play dead because the intent was there, there's a rule that says that's not allowed anymore and the play is reviewable to make sure a good goal stands, and there's another one that says, no, we're not allowed to do that. That's completely asinine. It's the NHL. It's the but, NHL's uh, – and the way they've handled – like look look at look at last year's Stanley Cup final. and that, uh, I think it was game two where P.K. Subban was offside, wasn't offside, and he had to go through that whole process of figuring out what – and it cost Nashville a goal. It's, it's yeah. 
they have not figured out most of these rules and they have not figured out any of their loopholes or gray areas. And so it takes these situations for them to try and figure it out. But they do a very bad job of getting to it. Like you can't really fix it now because you're already in the you've already started the season. And so you have to take a look at these things and and just try to, like, you know, get get through the get through the season unscathed. But they're already two games down in terms of the refs really kind of I, I got not blowing it, but I guess getting a little bit too big for the britches because in that one at that one Colorado St. Louis game, it was the linesman that was pretty much saying like, no, that play was the way I called it on the ice when he was bumped and he couldn't see the play. And then you have this situation where it's like, well, I was intending, I in, had the intent to blow the, the play dead, which there were, a, there are so many more egregious plays where they've blown play dead. And like, you know, the puck is completely past the goaltender and somebody taps mm-hmm. in and it's like, no, that was never a, no, I didn't see it because they just have these weird angles. The puck is small. It, the NHL just needs to do whatever it can to, you know, shore up these loopholes, but you're never going to take human error out of the game, and you're never going to be able to close every single loophole. There's just really no way to do it. Right. Well, look, and let, let me say this. I have no problem with replay being needed to clarify a call. I understand human error is going to be a part of it, and the fact that they utilize that doesn't, you know, it, it's this is the fastest-paced game that there is. You know, you know, football moves at a speed that goes for short bursts and then there's a pause and same thing and baseball is methodical and basketball is another one where there's a method to it hockey is just you know full-on chaos that on, on an ice surface and it moves quickly and you are bound to miss something i completely get that but if this is what you have cameras literally have a camera inside of an inside of the net for to try to get a better look at something then you've got to utilize replay the right way and make sure you're getting the call right. And if something's not reviewable, then don't even take a look at it. But stuff like that should be reviewable because that's a hard-working play by a team that's trying to tie the game. They think they've got it tied, and it's now apparently not allowed to be reviewed. It's just completely ridiculous that they allow that much gray area in there and can kind of go off of that reasoning that, I was going to blow play dead, which means I was going to stop everything. But but play carried on. It, part of the problem with this is the fact that they have quick whistles to begin with. They don't let some of these plays completely finish developing when a goalie is just starting to try to cover up. And I get it. You're protecting goalies because you need to, you know, they're in, they have their own space on the ice. They're in a goal crease. You're trying to make sure that that is their sanctuary, so to speak. But at the same time, you got a bunch of players who are trying to put the puck in the net. It's a league that's desires high scoring. They love scoring. Well, you're taking scoring away when you don't allow these things to happen because something's not reviewable or whatever. So, I mean, one of the other things, though, is obviously, you know, putting the calls aside for a second here because you do want to put the calls... At some point, and Ron Hextall said this on Friday, you've got to put that aside and move on and, and play the next game. It's over. Can't change it. Got to put it aside. And that's that's the truth. This team's got to move on from that. If if we remember correctly, now they had a long time between this. They really got to sit on the last one. But after that crazy game in Nashville with the back to back with the two penalties on the same play, the game tying goal gets scored, and then the the failed offside challenge that puts them back in the box, killing a five on three, turned to a five on four, and the game winning goal gets scored on the power play. You know. They came back from that one knowing and, and, and delivered a, a complete effort in the following game. It's going to be tough. Toronto's a good young team here. Um, Toronto's also coming off of a stretch of poor play of their own and have completely revamped everything. The lines were completely different at their practice on Friday. Fourth line, Mitch Marner. Yeah, it, which was pretty shocking too, yeah. So there's a lot of different pieces. They're moving stuff all over the place, and they're going to be pissed coming in. So it's it's no question about it that there's going to be a lot of things to consider. It's not, you know, but then again, everybody looked at that um, looked at the game for the home opener following that Nashville game, and it was Washington, last year's President's Trophy winner, coming in, you know, best team in the league over the course of the last few years, at least in the regular season. Ovechkin on fire, all of that kind of stuff. And they went out there, played a complete game, and demolished them. So let's see what happens in the next game that is to come. But really, at this point, you have to just try to let it go and move on. It's the best thing to do. 
My big thing is that this game is a lot like that Nashville game. They go down three Mm -hmm. real early. They essentially did this to themselves again. You don't go down, you don't spot teams three goals and you try to come back and expect good things to happen every single time. Uh, That Nashville game, they they obviously they fall down three and then they you know take a five three lead and then things go bananas. And in this game, they go down three. They try and tie up, but they can't quite ever get to that point. Like there were a lot of plays in that game, just like you know our last show, Kevin. I broke down. Hey, there was a lot of blame to be thrown other than a hack stall because you know mm-hmm. Claude Giroux dogged it on a back check. Uh, Brian Elliott uh, messed up a rebound, and those are those were two goals, and those were two goals that didn't need to happen. For the Flyers against Ottawa, there was that. Uh, I think it was Mark Stone, Michael Stone, who uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it right it's Mark Stone. It's Mark Stone, yeah, Mark Stone. Stone the defenseman. Uh, he did that backhand. He did that backhander that really you know, Michael Neuvert didn't have the strongest game, yep. although he's only played a few. Uh, the Flyers defensively were not that great. I mean, Eric Carlson really took advantage of a shorthanded opportunity when he saw that Travis Konechny was sk- skating backwards. Yep. And just like, all right, I'm going to go over to him because he's not a defenseman. And usually if it's a defenseman skating against a forward, you're like, all right, that's kind of balanced. But Eric Carlson's, you know, one of, the one of if not the best player in the National Hockey League. So he's going to take advantage of that. So it's not so – It's like, again, if you're going to be – if you're going to constantly put yourself in these situations, in two situations, not constantly, but if you're going to put yourself in these situations, it's – you know, you're going to get in these situations where the refs are going to either dictate what happens. And the best way to do it is you have these games like the Flyers played against Washington where it's was 8-2 to two, and there's no question in doubt. It doesn't matter how many calls the refs blow. You're up 8-2. to two. Right. Well, I, I, I think that another part of this is, is that – you know, look, the ga- the last couple of games, even the one nothing loss to Nashville, the Flyers were playing so well over the course of 60 minutes, being competitive again. We were, you know, we had talked about it off of the two big wins. And then, you know, yeah, is is the Nashville game disappointing? But, like, here, here's, here's the interesting thing. I was actually, um, I heard somebody say at some point in time after that game, how does the team go? How does the team go out and get shut out after scoring thirteen goals in their first two, in their last two games? It happens when you get pl- when you play against a team that defends well and has a good defensive grouping. Then they will hold you to limited goal scoring, and, and goal scoring is opportune. You can say the same thing about Nashville in that game: one goal, one shot, and that's all it sometimes takes to win a game. The Flyers just got beat by a goaltender. That's how that works. And then they responded with a good 2-1 to win in a very similar game. It's the last two that defensively, from a goaltending standpoint, collectively have been not only disastrous but disappointing because this was a team that from the start of the homestand after that wild Nashville game on the road to close out the four-game road trip had allowed five goals in the first four games of the homestand going into Tuesday night and closing out the five-game homestand. In the last two games now, you've got 11 goals against. It's it's alarming. And one thing I wanted to add, too, because we were, we're talking about the rules and we're talking about uh, you know the intent to blow – and everything that relates to that uh, that rule, um, why not just alter that the way that rule is structured and say, all right, if you blow the play dead, it doesn't count as a goal if it only affects the play on the ice. So if you blow the play dead and somebody stops working, then then it's not a goal. And you can right. see how you can see when somebody stops. Like these guys don't stop like hacking at the puck once you blow the play. They, once you blow the whistle once, you will have to blow it like 17 times to get these guys to stop. And then you have to push them away from each other. Yeah. So if you're going to have, you know, the, these rules, you got to like, give I, and want, you know, a good the good goal on the ice rule to, you know, overtake it. Then maybe that's the only way you can go it. Go with uh, the only route you can go with. But perhaps, you know, I, maybe there's a loophole in that I'm not seeing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's it's a lot of different things at this point, and those calls are those calls, and nothing's going to change that at this point. You know, you just got to move on and and try to put this behind you as best you can, but also put it behind. Like we said, like we said with that Nashville game, it was a good start to the homestand for the Flyers. They were you know two big wins to start that homestand, then the close loss and another good win. So you know if you can respond to another set of a series of adversity. This this stretch right now is really going to show what the Flyers are made of because it's going and we'll get more into this toward the end when we're wrapping up and doing uh the look ahead to the next week, but it's going to show what the Flyers are made of because this is a time for them to really 
face stiff competition here and not only face stiff competition but also be very tested. They're going to this is going to be a huge test for them as these next few games go by. And one of the reasons for that is we were talking about defensive play again and things like that. So I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a short break and then when we come back we're going to talk about some of the things with defensemen because one defenseman is now out of the lineup, and I watched the play last Saturday that ultimately did knock him out of the lineup. Um, we're we're going to just talk a lot about one flyer in particular that's a big talking point on Flyers' social media. So we'll talk about him. We're also going to talk about the goaltending and a couple of other odds and ends from the last week or so, just a couple of things with um, surrounding injuries and things like that and getting to all of that. So we're going to take a short break. Come right back here on the Flyer Duffy podcast. Stay with us. You're listening to the Flyer Duffy podcast with Kevin, Rob, and Dan on sportstalkphilly.com. Back here on the Flyer Duffy podcast and Kind of alluded to this in the end of the last segment there, but one player we're going to talk about right now is Andrew McDonald because the Flyers are without Andrew McDonald for four to six weeks with a lower body injury. Basically, no hiding it. It's 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 a knee injury. He took a shot right off of uh, right off of the shin guards there, right off of the knee of the of the padding there um, on a, on a penalty kill against the the Oilers last Saturday, and that it stung him. He managed to finish the shift off. I quite honestly watching it from where I was uh, in the press box, I'm not sure how he man- they managed to avoid getting scored on on that shift because he was really out of it. He actually had to dive back toward the goal crease just to break up another play that was very close to being a goal. So a lot of different things came into play with Andrew McDonald being um part of that shift and finishing it off so that the Flyers could uh, eventually finished off the game. It was still 1-1 at the time, too, and the Flyers did get the late goal to win 2-1. to But here's the thing with Andrew McDonald. We've watched um, the defensive play take a turn f- kind of for the worst in a way in the last two games, allowing the six goals to Anaheim, five to Ottawa. And we've watched Dave Haxtell have to shuffle defensive pairings up. We've seen defensive pairings. We've seen the Gostas bear Hague pairing split up. We've seen Haig with Travis Sanheim. We've seen Gostas Bear with, um, in a combination of, of situations, we've seen Gostas Bear with Ivan Provorov. We've seen several different things here. And we've watched these players just bounce around, and it really has taken a while for it all to work out. So let's talk about Andrew McDonald here and, and the new Flyers defensive pairings while he's not part of the lineup. Uh, we're also going to talk about Sam Moran as well because you would think – an injury of this magnitude opens the door for a call-up, but so far the Flyers have been rolling with the six defensemen still on the roster. Travis Sandheim's a regular in the lineup now. Brandon Manning slots in as well. So, guys, what are your thoughts on both Andrew McDonald here and then what, what the new pairings have done and what they need to do moving forward? Because, obviously, this is going to be the way that it is for a while, and we can look at this several different ways. But is Andrew McDonald now be... Is this going to be something, because, you know... When I had to, when we put the story up on McDonald's injury last week, I or actually it was more earlier this week even, I was fully prepared for to see way more of the celebration than than I did. I know that they existed. It's horrible to think that people are going to celebrate an injury to any player on a team you root for, but f- fans were going to do it because it was the it was not only a veteran that opened the door for a possible call-up. It was the guy that people love to hate, it seems. So are people starting to realize that Andrew McDonald as part of the Flyers lineup really holds some value, and can they make it through this next stretch of time, essentially another month, if not a little bit more still, without without Andrew McDonald and these new pairings going forward, or is something else going to have to change going forward? What do you think, guys? Well, with the way the, uh, you know, chemistry is a funny thing in the NHL, too, because, uh, you know, once McDonald falls out of the first pairing, Dave Haxtell has to shuffle all the uh, all the defensemen over again, like you were mentioning, Kevin. And then that kind of just screws up everybody's timing. So we're still only in that little transition area where guys are just trying to figure out who they can play with again. 
And it's really funny, too, because I was listening to the Hockey News podcast, and they were talking about how the New York Rangers defense is an absolute mess. And who did they lose over the course of the, uh, the offseason? They lost Dan Girardi. And you, pretty much Dan Girardi is the Andrew McDonald of the New York Rangers last season. And there has to be something. But he had really good chemistry with Ryan McDonough. And so once the, you can't really discount the idea that chemistry plays an impact with Ivan Provorov in the situation because he loses this guy that he's had for so long. And now he's got to play with a rookie in, in Robert Hag or he's got to play with another rookie in Travis Sanheim. You, you run into these situations where you're not quite sure what, you're, what that guy's going to do. You don't know where to put the puck. You don't know where to be. Ivan Provorov spoken very highly of how of how easy it is to play with Andrew McDonald. And once you lose that ease, you might need a couple of games to get it back with somebody else. Yeah, and I mean, you know, here's the, here's the thing I want to point out too is because don't don't undervalue any veteran presence on a defensive core here that 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 is made up of a second year player, two rookies, and a third year player. You know, it, there's a lot of development that's still going on even as far up as Shane Gossespierre at this point because we've seen Gossespierre have a much better start to the year this year offensively. He's looked more natural in his skating and getting up ice and controlling the puck, and that's always a good thing. But that pairing Gossespierre and Haig was really working well together. It's hard to adjust that. It, it, and apparently, you know, you got to remember it's also not as simple for the Flyers as I'm going to drop player X in alongside of Ivan Provorov just because one guy comes out of the lineup. There is still necessary movement that has to happen. The idea is how quickly can you get chemistry down, and obviously it's taken its fair share of time because these last couple of games have just been really tough to watch from a defensive standpoint, and it's why the Flyers have allowed so many goals in the last two games. But I'm not quite certain that Andrew McDonald would have made a tremendous impact. Like, he obviously is a warrior because he had that play where he pretty much busts his knee, and he's still playing. Anybody else could have just stayed on the ice or immediately tried to skate off or do whatever. He got up, and not only did he get up, he dove to try and stop a play and then cleared the puck out. Like, barely got it out, but he got it out. Like, this is not a guy that, like, deserves half of the flack that he gets. Like, the AMAC hate is out of control in terms of, like, he got ghosted at the Flyers Wives Carnival, allegedly, last season. He was booed at the home opener this yep. season. And then his, as you mentioned before, like, we probably, we didn't get it as much on our site, but the the, the hate, the, the uh, excuse me, the cheering for his his injury was around. And there's definitely a time and place to be encouraged at the idea that Sam Moran can play but not immediately after Andrew McDonald is hurt because that's a guy that's going to miss a month who just pretty much braved an entire shift on a busted knee mm -hmm. to help your favorite team. Well, and here's the thing. I And I think I put this in the post-game review from the Edmonton game last Saturday. Andrew McDonald was really in the running uh, as, as a player of the game. He had six block shots in that game, the most on the team, and the way that he handled that penalty kill – you know, you got to remember who, you know, think about the Edmonton Oilers power play and who's on it. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter who he's individually covering here. You saw a guy who really gave his all to try to make sure that the opposing team didn't score on the power play in a dangerous situation. It was getting toward the end of the period too. It was about eight minutes left, you know, so you're past the midpoint of the third period of a tie game, you know, where points are very valuable and this guy essentially gives his all and uh, at less than 100% gives it to make sure that your team is still tied following that penalty kill. It's a tremendous effort. You, you commend him for it. It was actually, to me, that whole shift was kind of a sign of how well, essentially, actually, how well Andrew McDonald had played to this point in the season. He was actually a very big part of the team's success and the way that the team was playing on the homestand at that point because that was the fourth game out of five on the homestand. And like I said, this was a team that at that point following that game had allowed five goals in four games and won three of them. It's It, it was really a tremendous turnaround, and you could see how far this team had come defensively. It wasn't just Andrew McDonald and Ivan Provorov and Shane Gossesberg being more responsible defensively than he was last year and Robert Haig holding down his own and Travis Sanheim playing in a game. You know what else it was? There was a commitment from forwards to play 
better defensively because the six defensemen were playing better. Claude Giroux was looking better defensively in that game as opposed to earlier in the season because there were a couple shifts where you could see he was out of position defensively, not really getting back in the play. He looked great in that game against Edmonton, I will tell you that. I thought he had a great defensive game. Things like that. You started to see guys buying into the 200-foot game and letting it create chances one way or the other, you know, or going the other way. And it's like the absence of this one player has really turned this team um, into not, it's not a complete disaster yet, but it has the potential to be because now you're relying on a lot of rookies to do a lot of things for you. And not only are you relying on rookies to do this, but you're asking them to replace the block shots that McDonald was getting, the veteran leadership. There's a lot of pieces going to place here. And there needs to be more commitment from the forwards as well to be helping hands in the in the defensive zone. So it's a, it's a collective team effort here. And the, the fact that the Flyers have allowed 11 goals in the last two games is not just on goaltending. It's not just on the six defensemen on the ice. It's a collective team effort. But you do start to wonder if the Flyers are going to do anything about it by calling somebody up. This type of injury was, you know, you got to remember, what was it two years ago when Shane Gostisbehar got called up? It was an injury that was long-term to Mark Streit that opened the door. Gostisbehar took the chance, never looked back. A long-term injury should be opening the door for Sam Moran, and it's kind of been a wonder where he is over the course of these last couple of games, maybe not for the home game against Anaheim, but definitely by the game against Ottawa, it was kind of like, huh, two games in a row just rolling the same six. I wonder, you know, why why that is or why they don't have a backup plan or something, you know? Yeah, it, like Dave Haxtell rolled the dice uh, against Nashville with that late uh, challenge, you know, a few weeks back. Now Ron Hextall is playing with fire by not having a seventh defenseman around, and it would be really nice if you could see Sam Moran in the lineup just, you know, because now you've seen a couple games and maybe you want to get these guys, you know, a little used to each other. But you know who Brandon Manning is and you and maybe you just want to have him like, you know, you gave him a couple games. All right. Now let's, you know, bring Sam Moran up along and see if he can, you know, because I think he's a little bit more. He's not closer to Andrew McDonald, but he's the type of guy that will do those things that you were saying, Kevin. He'll block the shots. He'll clear the front of the net. He'll, he can move the puck up ice pretty much relatively to the same ability that Andrew McDonald has. So if you're going to – if you're not going to bring him up and you're just going to play with six defensemen, it's also a huge gamble too because Radko Gudis could have gotten suspended uh, with that hit that he threw last night. He also could have gotten hurt with that one-punch knockout mm-hmm. against uh, – was it uh, Bieksa? Yeah, it's uh he it, you're really r- rolling the dice here by not having another guy along with you, especially when you're going to Ontario. Like maybe you can get somebody from the Phantoms up there same day taking a flight, but then that that guy's going to be travel beaten down. It, it it's kind of confusing. Maybe they don't believe in Sam Moran to the extent that we thought they did in the preseason because. And, and that's another. That's another thing. Why go through this? Why go through that whole like bachelorette type of, you know, showcase where they bring the two, bring all of those prospects with them, and then be like, yeah, we never believed in that kid to begin with. He's, he was, we're not even going to call him up now. Like, what, what was the deal with bringing Sam Moran and Travis Sanheim with you? Even you know, one defenseman was kind of hurt at the time, being Shane Gostas Bear. Mm-hmm. Well, I, one, I do. One, I think there was a purpose for Sanheim. He's obviously still here, but yeah. for Moran, it doesn't make any sense. You're right. One thing worth pointing out right now is that with a uh, with a big 5-2 win tonight uh, against Springfield, the Phantoms are in the middle of a, a six-game win streak. They're 7-1-1 one, one to open their season. So I think it's a matter of not wanting to fix what's not broken there. But at the same time, you got to focus on the big club. you got to focus on the issues going on with uh, with the pro team. You know, you got to you – know, I mean, Moran's been a, a big part of that great start for the Phantoms right now. But at the same time, you know, it, 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 rolling the dice with with the, with six defense, but you got to have a seventh guy into the mix. And you know, it's not ideal to to mess up what's going on with the Phantoms right now. But at the same time, you have to focus on what's best for the for the big team. Yeah, right. And, and truth be, truth be told, too, Rob, I believe um, in the middle of that of that winning streak for the Phantoms, too, they played Wednesday night against Bridgeport, I believe, and winning in overtime. But they only they got the game winning goal in overtime on the power play because of a. Uh, major penalty and game misconduct to a Bridgeport player for a uh, pretty bad hit on Mark Friedman. Yeah, or Spr- no, it, this was from Wednesday, from Wednesday. Were they playing Springfield on Wednesday? Springfield on Wednesday. Oh, okay. I Three to it was two Wednesday. overtime win. 
Oh, that's right. Okay, so it was Springfield. Um, but it was Mark Friedman got kind of roughed up in that one. I don't think he played again for the rest of that game. I don't. I'm. Is the guy named Simpson on their team? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. That's uh, they should right. <laughs> I can't get distracted by this. No, but it, it, <laughs> there are players out there that could have the last name Simpson. I know that. The, like, it's not like it's unheard of. Quick Simpson. Right. I think it's, it's, you're being a real homer about this, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> no, they had no Simpsons on their team. That's why they lost. Oh, well, there. Okay. See, there we go. All right. All right. To get back on topic <laughs> real fast. <laughs> yeah. The guy who drives the team bus, his name is uh, Otto. <laughs> oh man all right um it like it, we all agree that this is that the flyers are playing with fire by not having and I, and I would assume sam moran would be the first guy you called up and the one caveat to him is he needs to play he can't be the seventh guy right absolutely so like here's the pairings that i you know kind of came up with right before the show they might be a little spitballing uh Provorov and hag the first pairing because i still think that could be a, a decent pairing guys mm-hmm. are, agree with that at all i i wouldn't mind seeing it again I, I thought it got better as the game went on on thursday um i i wouldn't be opposed to it no and then i would have sam moran with shane goss to spare because i feel like that's still more of a natural pairing i feel like, like moran would be more natural on the right side too because i think you'd want goss to spare on the left side and then you have this the pairing that we've had uh excuse me the You've had the pairing that uh, Sam, uh, Travis Sanheim and um, Radko Gudis, Gudis, which has yeah. been yeah Sanheim and Gudis, which has been together pretty much the entire time that Sanheim's been in the lineups before McDonald got hurt. And then this way too, you have at least like and put this in quotation marks a veteran in, in on each pairing, at least a guy that's had a season. Yep. And so it's not a complete you know uh, throwing the kids to the wolves type situation like putting Sanheim and Moran together. Yeah, no, I I agree with that, and you, you're not going to, I mean, the shame of it is because you could also essentially reverse Hag and Moran, but you won't want to put Moran on top pairing minutes, that's the problem. It, that's the only reason that you wouldn't do that. Otherwise, the skill sets and the styles still fit there, because you'd have a, a puck-moving defenseman, a guy who kind of has an all-around ability. You know that's you know that's how the Gossespierre Hag pairing worked so well. Gossespierre was able to kind of get back in the offensive swing of things, be a guy who drove play, and Hag was more of the level-headed, stay-at-home kind of guy with with the ability to still move the puck a little bit. But he definitely embraced the defensive responsibilities. So you just want to see. Everything kind of come together. I do think that that top pairing of Provrov and Haig got better. Um, I'd like to see uh, Gostas Bears pairing get a little bit better as well, just because I think that they were starting to feel something too. I, I think Gostas Bear was having a pretty decent second half of that game against Ottawa, so I, I would like to see them pick it up a little bit as well. Um, but otherwise, I I don't know. I mean, it seems like they're rolling with six right now, but. It's it's not even just a matter of saying get Sam Moran up because I can there to an extent I can understand keeping Sam Moran in the minors if you're trying to get him top pairing AHL minutes that makes some sense if you were going to bring somebody up as an emergency situation and kind of sit there and go I don't want this guy to play but I want to have a seventh then you bring up a guy like Mark Alt or Will O'Neill and and stick them in the press box for a few games just so that you have a backup plan in case something else happens. But you're not going to bring Moran in unless he's going to play and play consistently, obviously. Yeah, you you could do that with T.J. Brennan, too. He's got NHL experience with Toronto as well. Yeah, TJ, of, uh, yeah the only reason T.J. Brennan's not in the discussion is because I think he's still battling an injury. Oh, okay. So he's been out of the Phantoms lineup for a while as well, so they're waiting on him. He's I think he's actually... Um, he might be out for a couple weeks, actually, because I think Ron Hextall updated that one. But that's, that's why Mark Alt fits, because Mark Alt does have very minor NHL experience. I think Will O'Neill does as well, so that would apply. And and you can get somebody like that up there and things like that. But you know, it, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. I don't think I'd be calling up anybody just to get in and replace somebody unless it was on Moran's level, you know. And the thing is, is he, he, he go a year from now, I guess, or if it was a year from now, a guy of Phil Meyer's skill set is the type that you would call up for a long term if you thought he was ready. Now, Myers is probably nowhere close near ready. He wasn't when he 
tried tried to be a part of the discussion in the preseason. He's still feeling things out in the AHL because it is still pro hockey that he's trying to get adjusted to. So Moran's and they definitely said that's the, the biggest most, leap too. Yeah, they said it's the biggest leap in 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 hockey is not going from the AHL to the NHL. It's the it's from juniors to the AHL. Yeah, and and it's and it showed a little bit for Meyer so far, no question. The Phantoms do have a uh, week off. They have a game tomorrow night against Hartford, mm. and uh, they're off for six days. They're next uh, back uh, playing Wilkes-Barre Scranton on the 3rd of November, next Friday. So if they do want to make a move, they can do something right after that uh, Hartford game, bring somebody in for this week of games that's coming up. Yeah, there yeah, that was would a... be an ideal, ideal time to do that. Yeah, there was a thought that the Flyers weren't making a move immediately because of the home game on Tuesday – uh, and the Phantoms were playing Wednesday, and the thought was that maybe ahead of the road trip and going aw- into Canada for two games, they could get a guy like Moran up after the Wednesday game uh, that the Phantoms had so that he could kind of jump back in and and go right in to the NHL lineup. But that, that never happened. They stuck with the same six. It looks like they're sticking with the same six for um, for Saturday's game against Toronto. And then... You know, truth be told, the Flyers stop back home in the middle of all this for a, for a game against Arizona on Monday before they go back on the road. So, and again, the road trip, like it's it's short little bursts of the road right now. They already played what what is I believe their season long road trip or ties the season long road trip um, to start the year by playing on the West Coast. So it's the two games, one more to go right now in Canada, then a home game, then two more on the road, then back home for. It's three in a row at home, but it's spanned over the course of almost of, of more than a week. So there's a lot of time for the Flyers to be settled in to try to make those decisions. And maybe they're just trying to get through the next little stretch without this. I don't know. It's really complicated. It's really tough to see them trying to do this this way with six. But we'll see where it goes, I guess. Before we who, uh, shift who gears. Who knew that yeah, Andrew McDonald would throw all of this into this kind of chaos yeah it's, we, we, it's really gone haywire since this injury no question it, you gotta give it, it, like to answer the question that you asked at the beginning of the segment did will flyers fans um essentially learn that like he's or appreciate what he does absolutely not but you can look at it now and be like wow he has played way more of a, of a role than you or i pos- could possibly have imagined because it, it just seems like now that like his block shots as you mentioned something that you know the analytics crowd doesn't even really appreciate is some is something that needs to be recreated without without him in the lineup. His veteran presence is now something that they just don't have, and it and you can see in those two games that they're just you know they don't have somebody to help balance them out and keep them level headed because they once one goal goes in, there's another goal, and there's another goal, and you're, all yeah. of a sudden you're down three nothing. I want to do something really quick, and then we're gonna wrap up this part and get ready to go on to the uh, look ahead to the next week um, because this is something kind of interesting because I I, I did – I'm not going to lie. I, I was the one who was doing – handling social media and I wrote the game recap for last night and everything like that. I threw a little shade out kind of um, after the Senators took a 2 nothing lead. Um, it was about f- two or three minutes after and we got and, – and we got a comment. Um, a reply to it that was, wonder what all the, a- this is what the tweet is, this is from Greg, wonder what all the AMAC haters are saying by now, by the way, I don't love him, but now where, but now where's the hate, like nowhere near hate him too, that's what he's trying to say, and so I retweeted that and quoted it and, and said, the and my the, my tweet with the Flyer Delphi account was, the Flyers have allowed eight goals in less than four periods without him, just saying. And I kind of wanted to see what that would do because it, it, it stirs the pot. I wanted to see somebody – basically I was expecting to see somebody say, oh, it doesn't matter. He still sucks, blah, 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 you know, because it's the typical response you get. And I was trying to stir the pot. I'm not going to lie. Um, and, and sure enough, there is one response that kind of like it, like asked what is, what is that – what do any of the goals have to do with that? Which uh, it has to do a lot with that because when your defensive structure is disrupted, you had the same – pairings for the first eight games of the year and nine and ten are not nowhere are nowhere near as defensively sound 
that does have an impact. But I, there's another comment that we got that was that was AMAC is overpaid and isn't a first pair guy, but the hate is over the top. The guy has played well this year and will be missed. So there's some rationale out there with this, and I think people are starting to see that. Yeah, I, I I agree with that sentiment, too. He is overpaid, but that's not his fault. His agent did a really good job, and Paul Holmgren did a really bad job of negotiating that contract. And you don't hate Andrew McDonald for the contract he signed. Like, you're an idiot if you don't sign that contract. That was Paul Holmgren's fault. If uh, right. Sports Talk Philly wants to offer me that money, then uh, I'd do the same thing. Well, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> if somebody st- put that kind of a contract in front of you, what are you supposed to do? Say, no, thank you, I'm not worth that? <laughs> that's it. Nobody does that. Whether you're my, worth it or my not. My father always told me growing up, you're worth whatever somebody else is dumb enough to pay it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you pretty much got that right. And you know what? If 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 that is what his contract hit is, that's what his contract hit is. I get it. You know, I get it. I get that it's a bad contract. I understand that. But for the most part, I want to know what he's done to at least prove that he's not an NHL defenseman since since they didn't keep him on the NHL roster a couple years back, and eventually bring him back up. What has he done that proves that he doesn't belong on an NHL roster? First pair of minutes? I'll agree with you. That's a little over the top, and the contract's a little over the top. But he is not out of the realm of NHL defensemen. Watch some of these other teams, you know. Uh, Dan, you mentioned how the New York Rangers are have a defense in shambles right now. Um, you could be watching, you know, I've watched a couple, there's a couple different games that I've watched with other teams where defensively you're kind of wondering what the structure is. Boston's had some moments this year. Montreal is completely a mess if you've watched any of their games. Teams like that, and they have no structure. McDonald does give you some structure. It's just a matter of if you can, you have to overlook the contract, which, what was he supposed to do, not sign it. And you have to overlook the minutes because, truth be told, there's actually probably a part of this that's making Ivan Provorov a better player because he's part of that pairing, and there's a comfort level. It, it It's, yeah, sure, it sounds a little ridiculous to think that, that he's the reason that Ivan Provorov plays so well, possibly, but it could be. There's a correlation to the fact that that pairing's been the same for much of last year and the start of this year. Yeah, if you're comfortable with a guy then you can start playing the way you want to play, even if he's not the greatest defenseman. Like the example I was using with uh, Ryan McDonough and Dan Girardi. Dan Girardi was by no means like the the, the best defenseman on the Rangers roster last year, but Ryan McDonough is. And so if they're playing well together, or at least Ryan McDonough is playing well with Dan Girardi, then there's like there's something to that. At least it, it, it allows him to play the way that he wants to play. And with Ivan Provorov, who's just a second year pro, if he can, you know, play the way he wants to play and is comfortable, then that's what you want. And mm-hmm. because once you lose that, then you might not. Then it's going to take a while for you for it to come back again. And one last thing on the Andrew McDonald hate, that should go away now for the play that got him hurt for a month. Because once he got his, once he hurt his knee, stayed on the ice, dove to make a play to stop a goal essentially, and then clear clear the puck on a power play to you know pretty much kill the penalty off. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that. Like, there are Flyer fans that have become folk legends for less than what Andrew McDonald did. Yeah. And, you know, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I know he at least tested it out. He might have taken one more shift after that later in the game as well. It, 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 as brief as it might have been, probably just to test it out, he was on the ice lined up to at least be a part of a face-off. So I do believe that he may have been on the ice for just a few seconds afterwards to at least try to test it out. But you're right. A guy gives his all, and this is the kind of like the thanks he gets just because you don't like his contract. It's ridic- That's ridiculous, too. So we're going to take a short pause here, come back, kind of look at the week ahead and everything that's to come with, um, with everything with the next few games to the Flyers. We've already mentioned Toronto coming up on Saturday, a few more to come in the week ahead. We'll get into those coming up next on the Flyer Duffy Podcast. Stay with us. You're listening to the Flyer Delphia Podcast with Kevin, Rob, and Dan on SportstalkPhilly.com. Back here on the Flyer Delphia Podcast, and we've really talked quite a bit extensively about the defense. We've talked extensively about Thursday night's game. 
the things leading up to Thursday night's game that have brought the Flyers to the 5-5-0 record that they hold right now going into Game 11 on Saturday night. We're going to now jump ahead to the week ahead. So four games over the course of the next week for the Flyers. Saturday against Toronto on the road. They come home to face the Arizona Coyotes. Then a back-to-back road game situation. Kind of like the uh, way the season opened for the Flyers. It's their first set of back to back since then. They will play Chicago and St. Louis both on the road as well. Tough schedule, guys, obviously. But you're going to get some tests here. I think you're going to learn a lot about what the Flyers are and what they're made of coming up. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I hope you like the Western Conference because you gotta you gotta get used to that one. Yeah, and over the next this month, is a, this is a bad time for your goaltenders not to be playing all that great. Brian yeah. Elliott, even in a win against Edmonton, gave up a really bad goal to Pat Maroon, former Flyer uh, prospect. Pat Maroon never was actually a Flyer, but he was a prospect. Mm-hmm. Um, a talented and, prospect at that. Yeah, he was a really highly talented. Pro- I think he was the best prospect they had at that at that time. That was how poor the phantoms were at that at that time but this is i think he tried fighting a coach yeah he, he was he, he he had a uh a quibble with the coaches <laughs> and they uh the the, the flyers uh, chose the coach over him and then they lost both it was uh it, it was a, another banner moment for uh paul holmgren at that time yeah. but, go home. <laughs> but uh another well look they're they're playing austin matthews in toronto and if toronto could do nothing they can score and they can make you look stupid if you if you don't know what you're doing defensively. And we've just went through that whole, you know, block before talking about how this defense doesn't have any structure without Andrew McDonald anymore. And now the goaltenders aren't playing that well with Brian Elliott and Michael Neuvert really wasn't all that good against Ottawa. And he looked like he was kind of back like Arizona. They can probably make you look stupid. They haven't looked good, but they still got some offensive talent on there, and then that back-to-back against Chicago and St. Louis, I- I'm already kind of penciling L's in there right now, unless you know Neuvert or, or, or Elliott or both turn their games around real fast because they're going to need goaltending in those games. Yeah, I mean, my thought on this is kind of, look, typically so far throughout the year, it's been easy to kind of detect when the Flyers were going to go back to or go from one goalie to the next. It was really easy to track where Brian Elliott was going to slot in after the first game of the year and then moving forward. And I was pretty certain that after the way that the game against Anaheim went for Brian Elliott, that Michael Neuvert had at least the next start on Thursday, which he did, if not the next two. I'm not sure where Saturday's game goes at this point. I think that there's a part of me that thinks Neuvert gets it just because you want to give him a shot to bounce back from his first bad game because there was certainly nothing wrong with the way Neuvert played in his first three starts. He was tremendous in all three, lost two of them by virtue of shutout losses for the for the opposition, but otherwise had played tremendously in all three. Brian Elliott will need a bounce back here. I think that in, in the case while we're talking goaltending here, because it's it's not another it's just not another flyer season if we don't talk goaltending and early in the year too because you know we're only 9 10 games in you know so we're getting ready for game 11 make no mistake about it Brian Elliott has been average just average at best there's the numbers are average the performances are average he's he, you know he's just happened to have been on the right side of a lot of decisions you know he's made six starts he's got four wins so he's on the right side of the decisions he's getting wins but he's not getting he's not making some of the saves he has to make, you know, and at some point in time you need your goalie to make a save. Now that thing, that rings true for Neuvert as well from just Thursday's game. His first three starts were tremendous. Um, It's really hard to argue with his performance. He's been the better goalie so far, Thursday included. You know, that was was the first we've really seen of bad Neuvert in a, it's kind of like a play on good cop, bad cop in a sense where Neuvert is, one side or the other. It's a Jekyll and Hyde situation. You're getting either the really, you're either getting one that's really good or you're getting one that's really bad. And Brian Elliott's very similar, but you're a rogue cop, Neuvert. <laughs> but you're gonna have to Time see rotation. Gun. <laughs> but you know that rotation's coming in some way, and I just don't know when they're gonna go back to Elliott at this point. I would have thought that there was no way it was gonna happen this weekend. I'm not so sure, just based on the fact that the way that that game went. You know, you feel like I, I, I was trying to figure out, and I think that Michael Neuvert wants at least, I think he wants two of the goals that he gave up on Thursday back. And actually, I know we talked about the Mark Stone goal. 
my thought was he wants the shorthanded goal back that was scored um, because I think I think that that one was a spot where he needs to come up with a save. I think he also wants the two on one back. And you know, I don't, I'm not saying that the shot on the two on one by Tom Pyatt was bad. It's just that it's one of those things where you could use a big save from your goalie, and again, he didn't give it to you. So you need to figure out who it is and see if you can get some big saves. It's the, truth be told, Neuver got them a big save toward the end of that game that makes the idea of the goal call or no goal call even larger because it wouldn't have mattered if that wasn't if that save wasn't made. So we do have to factor that in. And, and the thing is, is that what's another reason the Flyers lost on Thursday by, a, by just one goal? Aside from all the things we've talked about with the officials, Craig Anderson made a big save on Sean Couture on a power play in the first period and robbed Valtteri Filppula from the front of the net in the final minute and a half, right before the impending review or or non, because it it didn't exist apparently. But you know that that's what I'm saying. There were big saves from Craig Anderson in this game as well that help you win a hockey game, and that's the thing. You just need to get your goalie to make a big save for you. But I agree with you guys. First of all, I'm a little, you know, we had talked about this weeks in weeks past. The Western Conference and how many opponents you're seeing from the Western Conference, because it's been a lot. You started with the West Coast trip, San Jose, L.A., Anaheim, Nashville. You got a small taste of the Eastern Conference with Washington, Florida, back to the West with Nashville again, Edmonton, Anaheim. Now you're getting a taste of the East again. Ottawa, Toronto on Saturday. Then it's Arizona, Chicago, St. Louis, and it'll be Colorado the following Saturday too. Every so, game through uh, November the twenty second, uh, that they'll, they'll play the Islanders. Then, but every game before then is a Western Conference game. It, it, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah, and you're and you you're have right, a home at home with the with Minnesota. Yeah, you have a home and home with Minnesota. You, it's How Chicago. Often do you see that? Yeah, Chicago's season series. They're the season series with Chicago. I should say wraps up one a little more than a week after the first meeting on the road. They're gonna get just like win- uh, how it was with the Ducks and the Predators, almost. Yeah, they're gonna get Winnipeg early. I see. There's a home game against Calgary in there, so there's a lot. I mean, you got everything. It's it's the whole, it's the whole nine with the Western Conference. By the it's time a whole the whole cornucopia fl- of Western teams, it really is. And you're right. By the time the Flyers play at a home and home with the Islanders, it's gonna be the road game, and then the and then the Black Friday home game. It's it, they've they all have seen. I mean, what they'll have probably seen almost the whole Western Conference by that point. Maybe not quite, but it's it's going to feel like it. And then this doesn't really stop because you just said the Black Friday. If you go into December schedule, they go into a, a West Coast road swing. So this doesn't really stop until the Army Navy game, and you won't get that <laughs> reference unless you're a college football fan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's this is this is pretty wild actually. Then between October and November schedule, as I'm looking at it right now. They played Washington and Florida already. They've played Ottawa on the road. They get Toronto on the road on Saturday. They have the home and home with the Islanders at the last full week in November, and then Pittsburgh the Monday after Thanksgiving. And until then, when they play Boston, or actually lump Boston in there too, at, at the start of December, because then the then that other West Coast um, Western Conference trip. It's not really a West Coast, but it's the Western Canada trip, basically. Um, will take them through the first full through the first almost the first half of December, having played eight games against Eastern Conference teams by then. I think their total game total by that point will be more than a quarter of the way through the season by that point, pushing you know the range of twenty to twenty five games. We're going to be up to eleven already. There's twelve games for them in the month of October, and I think another it looks like fifteen in November. So. By the time they play Boston with their with that game that starts December and then play three more against Western Conference teams, that home game against Toronto on December 12th will finally be a string of Eastern Conference games. And even then, they play two more and they get two more Western Conference games. It's, this is, it's, it's a crazy schedule to look at. This, this just reminds me. Of, remember how they used to schedule before they decided every team needs to play each other twice, where you play like your own division uh, rivals like six times a year? That was great. Why can't we just go back to that? I love seeing the uh, Flyers play the Rangers and the Devils and the and the Penguins six times instead of like, oh, no, we got to see them play Arizona in Arizona. Boil yeah. the coffee. 
It used to make those games a little bit more exciting, too, because when they would go on the road to play a team like Dallas or L.A. or something like that, it was few and far between. So, Or when the, one of those teams came into Philadelphia. It would happen every maybe two years if you were lucky, usually three, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's not, I like it better that I, I do kind of agree with you. It would be cooler to see more. I, I feel like it would make this idea of trying to have rivalries a lot more relevant. Although it is cool that uh, I mean, considering all the talent across the league, you know, like you're, you're it's guaranteed that uh, guys like uh, Max Domi or Clayton Keller or Patrick Laine or what have you are, are going to be playing at Wells Fargo Center. You get a chance to see these guys at least every year. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's no secret. Well, I, I think there's no secret that you know when McDavid came in on Saturday last week, it was it, it's a big deal. You know, McDavid is just as much kind of becoming just as much of a villain. Um, as anybody else is just in terms, and, and I'm not saying like I'm not saying that to make it sound like he's a hate, a truly hated player. But people don't like the fact that he kind of tried to show up the whole situation with Brandon Manning from a year ago and things like that, which really should just yeah. That was that was the one now, but... time in his young career that uh, Connor McDavid didn't try to be completely milk toast. Right, <laughs> but y- y- we get the point. But you know what I mean. I'm saying like it creates a situation where you want to see a guy, and, and you know. Fans were booing him every time he touched the puck in that game. Just, be- I love just it. because, you know, just because it creates a situation where you get to see players, you know, that that are running the league essentially. That this is the league's MVP from a year ago. You know, things like that. You want to see guys like that. And now, granted, is the season series for that one will wrap next month. But and 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 you're getting a lot of these home games out of the way. I, I personally kind of. There's a part of me that goes, I don't want to see it constantly. I like the idea of rivalry games, but I do want to also, I like the idea of seeing a March and April schedule that's loaded with more teams from the division and the conference. Kind of like how it is in uh, baseball. Yeah. You want to, like, yeah, when September comes around, it's pretty much all divisional games. Yeah. I, I, that's the way I would rather see it. I mean, I, I remember some of the best games that, of recent memory and things like are when the Flyers would play Pittsburgh twice in April before the playoffs. Because that was the, that was the time you want to see it. Intensity is getting a little higher, especially if both teams have playoff hopes or are in line for it. The Flyers clinched a playoff spot two years ago by beating the Penguins in a game at the end of the regular season. And even though Pittsburgh had nothing to play for and sat guys in that game, there's an element of saying beating the Penguins get to get there. You know th- that it gets people hyped up and they want to see it. And you know, I look at the end of the schedule. Even what's the last game of the regular season? For this year, that's on the schedule. Flyers Rangers. Does that bring back any memories? It should. Yeah, I, I personally, I love rivalries, and so like if you're saying like, oh well, fans get to see Connor McDavid. You should be trying to see Edmonton Calgary as much as you can, because that is a true blue old school NHL rivalry that you can, you know, that's. You know, those two teams are back, essentially. Like, Calgary's, I don't know, they're struggling a little bit, but they should be really good. And if you get a chance to watch these teams, like, you don't want to watch Connor McDavid play, like, the Islanders. You kind of want him to play a team that's going to challenge him, like, the, you know, like, the Flames or the Ducks, a divisional rivalry. Not, like, watch the Fly- have, have to watch the Flyers play Vancouver, which is, it sounds as interesting as it as it probably will be. <laughs> Yeah. Remember there was that there was a time throughout the uh you know the 90s where the Flyers in Vancouver would play like every New Year's Eve. Yeah. yeah. That was weird. And there's still some footage of some of those games on YouTube if you go search if you search in the right places. But yeah, I mean The 90s were a weird time. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. A um, lot of third jerseys, a lot of third jerseys that were really weird too. Yeah. Remember the Ducks in the Lightning's third jerseys? It was just like <laughs> a cartoon. Oh my god. I believe believe the Islanders had one in there too. Oh, that one they called attention to it when they got rid of it. They said like they announced no more silly logos or something, <laughs> and they had to bring back the the NY that's a hockey stick, which is a good logo. Yeah, Don't that is a, that were... is a quality hockey logo. Yeah, <laughs> I will give the Islanders a lot of credit, but I will give them credit there. You got to nail the logo, man. If you, if you don't, you're <laughs> all just, about you're the disgraced. aesthetic. Yeah. Well, and, well, anyway. The schedule is is tough moving forward. It's this is going to be a make or break time for the, for this team. You know, the stretch at the end of October can determine a good start from a poor one or an average one. We've heard Dave Haxtell already use the word average to describe the homestand, 
and, and you know the push into November is where you need to try to begin to separate yourself from the pack if you want to be in the playoff conversation if you think that the Flyers have done some things to make them part of that potentially part of that conversation they definitely look like a faster team they definitely look like a team that's not out of a game in a lot of situations like we said you know even as bad as the first period went in that game against Ottawa, they were in that game at the end. It certainly ca- and came close to tying it. So they were in it, no question about it. So they've only had one game where they've really been completely out of it from really the early stages of the game. So what what you need to do is you can't put yourself behind the eight ball completely here. The Flyers have started to fall back on that. They've started to they've lost a couple of games here where they need to try to get back out of that, try to correct it. You know, the problem is, aside from the Coyotes, who have been slumping really poorly in a really big way lately, I mean, this that team's off to a really bad start, and to the point where I believe I believe former Flyer Nick Cousins is the one who said that they, who called them a very fragile team right now. It's not the type of things you want to be hearing from your players. So the Monday game against Arizona could be a big chance for the Flyers to get on the right side of things. Otherwise, look at Toronto who is also coming off of a forgettable game. They lost 6-3 to three to Carolina. They've switched everything up. They they also lost to Ottawa 6-3 last Saturday. They got a good win against the Kings on Monday, 3-2, to two, but lately it hasn't been all perfect, and they've only played three games, in the, since last, or yeah, three games since last Saturday. So this is a team that's going to be determined to have a better start, a better performance. They've got the star power, especially on the young side and on in the scoring department. Take your pick. You want to? Do you want Matthews, Nylander, Marner? You know, take your pick. And then not only that, but they got a pretty good score in Patrick Marlowe as well, who is still getting it done at this point in his career. So that's going to be tough. Chicago is always tough. St. Louis has been off to a good start despite the injuries, and not to mention the fact that there's a little element of that St. Louis game with with the fact that it's the first time the Flyers will be seeing Braden Shen as part of the opposition. And I'm sure that's fresh in the mind of of the former flyer, especially while on home ice. So, that, just just to jump in real here, real yeah. quick with those with those games, and like St. Louis is real good, as you you were saying. Chicago is always a threat with Patrick Kane, and then you have Toronto. Like they're up and down with their the defensive play, but they can still light you up. That makes that game against Arizona. And like I hate using this term because it's October, mm-hmm. but that's kind of a must win. That's the game you really have to win out of the next four because you. It's a bubble game with Toronto mm-hmm. because, you know, you you don't know, just like with the Flyers, you don't know what they're going to do defensively. You just know that they can light you up. Mm-hmm. And then with Chicago and St. Louis, you can't count on coming out of there with Ws. You just hope for maybe you can squeak out an, a point in overtime or a shootout. Right. So that makes – you cannot, cannot have a letdown against Arizona. They had multiple letdowns against Arizona last season yeah. i believe it was also in october so you can't let that happen again you have yeah. to come away at home with two points against the coyotes here's the thing about arizona look the flyers by all accounts this year are better you know are doing better at getting at scoring goals than they were in previous years they've they've got players who are scoring right now it's not like there are players in scoring droughts and goal differential is a big thing here arizona has played 10 games this includes um, they played last night against the Rangers, who are also not off to the best start, and lost five to two to them. In ten games, Arizona is zero nine and one, so they have not won a game yet. Only one of the games got to overtime. They have a goal differential of minus twenty one. Even the Flyers, in their even five and five record, have a plus five goal differential. They are outscoring teams by five over the course of it. Now, a lot of that was the win over Washington. Don't get me wrong, but. They haven't lost a lot of games where the margin made that change either. You know, there was the goal differential was negative four in the loss to Anaheim on Tuesday, but it's usually been minus one when they lost. Minus one. They've lost a couple of one goal games here that make a difference too. So the Toronto game is going to be tough, no question about it. Toronto is off to a really good start too. It's only recently that they've really hit a wall losing two of the last three, and not in a very good way. Both were 6-3 losses. So in 10 games, though, to win seven games is a good enough start that that's a team that you don't want to get into a shootout with and get, and, and be dealing with it that way because they will make you pay. And no, no question that the um, that the leader the Air, of all that is Austin Matthews. And the Air Canada Center is a house of horrors for the Flyers. They usually do not have good outings. Last year, the, 
they had a, an atrocious third period against a team, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs team that you know essentially. Is- but this one has so much more confidence. This one with Austin Matthews, is, he's off to a great start. So just you're going to have to go there. You're going to have to play. I don't want to say a perfect road game, but you're going to have to play damn near a, a perfect defensive road game mm-hmm. because that team does. That team will make you look stupid if you don't know what you're doing in your own end. Yeah, it, it's going to have to be. I mean, everything's going to have to be pretty much perfect. I, I feel I feel the same way about the Chicago and St. Louis games. You know, and the Flyers. Let's not miss. Let's not mistake it. The Flyers played two really good road games back to back to start the season. Things are a little different. They're banged up a little bit with McDonald out. We actually kind of. It's hard to believe we've been talking for this long. It didn't even mention that Nolan Patrick missed a game with the uh, upper body injury. But the fact that he's practicing is a good sign. He his goal is to try to get back in the lineup on Saturday. If not Saturday, I would think he's back playing by Monday. Just because he's been practicing for a couple days now, it's all, from what I understand, it's all league stuff. It's all league protocol that kept him out of the game on Thursday to begin with, and it, w- it would be if he wasn't in the lineup on Saturday either. So if they can get him back in the lineup and, and restore some of the things with the forward lines, um, everything, you know, there's no reason to believe the Flyers couldn't put together a game that beats any of these teams. It's just that they're going to need to play nearly perfect it's pretty pretty close to it for sure or in that situation because you you quoted the first two games of the season Mm -hmm. one of those teams is going to have to cough up the game like san jose did namely the way martin jones did because he definitely Mm -hmm. had himself a rough first period uh against the flyers in the opening night so if somebody like you know uh a crawford or a jake allen uh if they you know, if they botch a couple of plays, Flyers can be right there, right there with them. It's mm-hmm. it's not like the, those teams are significantly better than the Flyers. It's just that there are teams that can take advantage of a young defensive core mm-hmm. and also take advantage of the fact that the Flyers sometimes aren't the best back checking team. So, right, and it's not like those teams as... are incapable of giving up goals either. They've they've yeah. been seen to do it. So yeah, they're none of them are suffocatingly boring as the L.A. Kings. So you know, <laughs> the Flyers have a chance to score on those two teams. Absolutely. Before we wrap it up then, guys, any final thoughts? Uh, well, you know, since you just mentioned Nolan Patrick uh, and, you know, the concussion protocol, just take as long as you need with the kid. Don't do not do anything stupid. Don't rush him back. Uh, you know, you've seen this a bunch of times with other players. Specifically, Flyer fans have seen that with Eric Lindros, where they definitely didn't help, help anything. But, you know, last season, the Florida Panthers didn't help anybody. Uh, specifically Aaron Eckblad, by trying to play him when they didn't really need to. So the kid, you know, if they need to, you know, follow the protocol, just follow the protocol. If you have to lose a game, you'd rather lose the game than lose Nolan Patrick. So Absolutely. Do what you have to do and keep that kid healthy. And uh, also keep an eye out for these uh, young guys in these next two games, Toronto and uh, Arizona. Guys like uh, you mentioned Matthews, Marner, uh, Clayton Keller, Max Domi, Anthony the Duke Duclair. You know, these are – all exciting, high-flying young guys, and that's what I'm looking forward to in these matchups, just you know, seeing how, uh, how the Flyers can fare against these guys. You know, Very fun to watch, and that's what I'm looking forward to. The last time I, th- I thought the Flyers were going to play in a high-flying game like they played against Ottawa, it was against Nashville, and it was one nothing. So my expectations <laughs> are I don't know what they should be, actually. Uh, yeah, keep your expectations tempered, too, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, I, I was expecting 6-5. Uh, I hope it's 6-5 because that's that's those are always fun, but it's probably going to be one nothing now well, in Toronto. Here's and, the, uh, Prime here's Minister the... Trudeau, I, I don't think I forgot about that. I'm still owed an explanation for last night's <laughs> game, and I know you can help out with that. Well, here's here's the thing. I wouldn't have, have expected one nothing against Nashville on like or last Thursday. I certainly didn't expect 2-1 against Edmonton. The, in the following game, either that I thought was going to be way more wide open than it was. It was. It don't get me wrong. Very good game. There's a lot of good games that can be can come out of those low scoring games, especially when there's chances on both sides. But didn't expect it to be that low scoring. Not not even close. So we'll see what happens. I think I think if one thing we've learned one thing so far through ten games, expect the unexpected. I guess right. Expect the best. Prepare for the worst. Well, okay, we'll 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 expect the. I, I don't know. Maybe we should expect Always the worst. Always look on the bright side of life. I I like your philosophy, Rob, and we're gonna leave you with that then. So that's gonna do it for the Flyer Delphia podcast for this week. Uh, we want to thank everyone for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Um, 
possibly actually what we're possibly going to be doing is is that it seems like I'll be the only one um, around for next week so I may jump on Facebook Live next Friday just to talk about some things for a little while maybe do a half hour session on Facebook Live for everybody who wants to tune into that um, and we can talk a little bit and do an exchange and read some comments and do do stuff like that and then we'll be back again probably the following week with the full crew uh, so once again thanks everybody for listening for Rob Riches and Dan Heening, I am Kevin Durso, and this has been the Philadelphia Podcast on SportsTalkPhilly.com. This has been another edition of the Philadelphia Podcast with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heening, presented by SportsTalkPhilly.com.